With growth comes more management. But people management doesn't have to be the headache you think it could be. With the right process, you are able to hire and train an incredible team of people inside your business to support you, your clients, and your growth. Today, I'm joined by one of my amazing Spring 3 coaches, Katie Santos, who is an HR expert. And we're talking all about what you need to know about hiring a fantastic team. Well, hi there. I'm Sarah Glanfield. I'm a business and marketing strategist just for boutique fitness studio owners like you. If you're ready to be inspired and make a bigger impact, you're in the right place. All you need are a few key strategies, the right mindset, and some support along the way. Join me as I share the real life insights that will help you grow a sustainable and profitable studio. This is the Pilates Business Podcast. Welcome back to the Pilates Business Podcast. I'm Saran. Thank you so much for joining me here again today. Now, I'm super excited because today I'm joined by a fellow business coach, but also a really good friend um, and also a, um, a team member at Spring3. Katie Santos is um, an expert in uh, studio business management but recently she has transitioned into specializing in human resources. So what we know is as we build our businesses, we often need to hire people to help us do that, right? And that brings along its own set of uh, questions, challenges, and so on. Now, Katie has been teaching Pilates since 2000. She has actually been teaching fitness for 40 years, if you can believe it. Um, and we have actually known each other for nearly eight years now. So we have been through a lot together in the Pilates world. Um, so I'm super excited to welcome Katie here to share, to share with us today. Welcome, Katie. Thank you, Sarah. And it's so great to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. So Katie, um, a little bit more on her background. She actually ran and owned a very successful studio, Pilates studio, um, for 18 years. Um, she was also a teacher trainer for Balanced Body. So she's really seen all the different uh, elements and components that goes into building and growing a successful studio business. But as I said, her uh, focus has shifted more recently towards the um, management and human resources side of our industry, of the fitness industry. Um, and so I'd love, and, and as I'm sure you, everyone who's listening is aware, you know, this is a really important component that is often, um, that often raises a lot of questions and a lot of challenges. So Casey, why don't you tell us a little bit about um, what sort of drew you to this kind of work after with all of the experience that you have? Well, you would think this would not be a place for a Pilates teacher to land, but <laughs> truly, um, when you think back to like your first job and you had to deal with personnel, the current HR is not really that sort of person that you were scared of when you were 16 in your first job. It's really a position of planning the entire business to fit the staffing needs that it has. So it's a little different that hiring years ago was just getting a body in and you did your work and then you got recognized. But what's different now is businesses have to craft themselves around the people that they want to have long-term, right? Yeah. So my overall goal in life is to improve people's movement. And while I can't do that in the studio anymore, if I can support businesses to not only improve people's movement, but improve their staff's lives, it's a win. I'm reaching more people that way. And, you know, the reality is, especially here in California, where it's, you know, 20 minutes after the hour, laws may have changed already. Mm -hmm. um, it's not, you shouldn't expect yourself as a business owner to be able to keep up with these sorts of things. But yet the jurisdictions want you to. So who do you turn to as a reliable resource to help you through these kind of rule changes and law changes and what you can and can't do with your staff or for your staff, that sort of thing. So 
that's where I'm focusing these days. And I, I find it really rewarding. Indeed. And I expect that, you know, you, I know, knowing you as well as I know you, one of the most organized people that I know, um, and a big fan of processes and systems, um, that you have all of, you have the, 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 exactly what folks need to be able to hire successfully and manage successfully. Mm -hmm. And when I think, you know, this, when you're able as a studio owner to leverage the power of a team who is, you work very well with, who understands what your business is all about, who supports you and can support you well, um, it just completely changes the trajectory of your business. But not only that, going back to you, what you know, what, what, what motivates did you to do this work, which is that, and, and myself too, you know, why we're all here is to help people move, more people move and enjoy their movement practice. And when you have got a fantastic team of teachers um, and who are all uh, helping and supporting one another, you know, that really feeds through into the energy in a studio, right? Right, right. We, um, one of the reasons we changed to employers or employees really early on is we wanted to be able to have a consistent experience for the clients that came in our studio. And with independent contractors, all we could do was sit in the office, we being my two partners and I, and just kind of eyeball the people that were on the training floor and go, I'm not so sure what's happening out there, but yet I can't tell that trainer how to teach the client. So that was one primary reason why we, we shifted, we made the shift. And when we did end up closing, we had such a cohesive team of teachers that knew our culture, that knew our brand, that appreciated the fact that we were organized and we had systems and policies that were easy for them to understand. You know, I know how to call in sick. I know how to get subs. I know how to submit my payroll, all of the things. It made their job so much easier and they trusted us because they knew that they could come to us with um, issues or problems or challenges, particularly particularly with clients. Um, that team was so great and cohesive. It was very sad to let them all go. It was the right decision. But we also stay in touch still three years down the road, almost on a monthly basis, if not weekly, occasionally with our people. So what is, what does that show you? If you have that in your studio, it's an awesome thing. It really truly is. So I have a couple of questions for you. First of all, I think, um, you know, you mentioned that you had moved to the employee model sooner than most and probably sooner than necessary than was required legally. Right. So can you touch on a little bit about, um, what that looks like for a studio to, to go through the process of transitioning from independent contractors to, to an employer model, employee model, and then also talk a little bit about um, what the difference is and what that yeah. looks like. Sure. Like well, there's actually three things now that are, that are currently uh, in vogue, so to speak. You know, the first is the employee model. The second is the independent contractor model. And then the third I'm seeing a lot of is the renting, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Ursa, we, I was at Ursa recently and sat in on Fisher Phillips presentation about just this thing. And I'll start by saying that one of the things they addressed in particular, because a uh, uh, attendee had brought it up, was about this rental model. And they were pretty clear that that model because of what I'm going to tell you next, was not a viable option for businesses, especially in California. So the, the difference really comes down to a couple of things. The first is control, right? So like I said previously, I couldn't leave my office and go tell that independent contractor teacher how to train the client because that would be seen as control. I had to let that person do their thing and you know, I gave them a check at the end of the month and that was that. The second but most important for us is when the independent contractor or the renter is doing the same service that your business consists of, i.e. teaching Pilates, you're a Pilates studio, or teaching Pilates, you're a fitness studio, 
then that, that service in and of itself denotes that they are an employee. That's different than hiring you or me, Saren, as a consultant, because we are not an integral part of their business, although we help them out. We're not in there teaching Pilates. We're teaching them business skills. So that's the definition of an independent contractor. Occasionally, it comes to me that, um, so for instance, a Pilates studio will say, well, I've hired a Reiki teacher or a yoga teacher. And if you step back and you think about it, if you were to tell a state auditor, well, it's different, it's yoga, and I teach Pilates, we can't expect that state auditor to understand the difference. They're going to see movement or fitness as a big umbrella with all the things underneath it. So when we changed over, we did it because there were still some um, issues around the law that we weren't quite sure of, but like I said, it was about control. We approached our people and said, listen, we understood that our burden as employers, in other words, what we're gonna end up having to pay was about 16 to 18%, maybe a little more than that now. So we went to our teachers and we said, here's the deal. We're going to drop your rates by 9%, but you will then as an employee be able to have workers comp, you'll have sick pay. Um, we made the choice at that point to pay their insurance. So we carried our own policy and then we paid their policy as well. They had benefits as being an employee where they had studio perks like a free membership. If they taught at a certain number of um, hours per week, they could bring in a significant other for a certain amount um, for classes, space available. So there were other perks like that that ended up actually benefiting them, especially from a tax perspective. They, um, they ended up not having to pay their self-employment tax and any penalties that might have gone along with it. So they ended up making more money. We had a more consistent product. Mm -hmm. People came to us, clients came and said, well, it doesn't really matter if I teach with Sally or I teach with, or I, I learned from Jane. The consistency is good, it's, which is not to say we took their personality away, but everyone right. was on the same same page, you know? Yeah. And tell us a little bit about what that means for from the employer. As, when you become an employer, what the difference is from, you know, what do you need to do differently as an employee, as an employer versus having right. a team of independent contractors? So first off is to establish yourself with the state um, from a tax perspective. So you need a tax ID number. You um, then need to find out all the current rules and laws in your jurisdiction as far as labor laws and things like that, primarily around sick pay and leave, whether it's for um, maternity leave or jury leave. And I will tell you, because I do handbooks for just about every state, every state is so different. Yes. <laughs> so we have to go down the rabbit hole and find like, what are the rules over here? They're, they're very different. Um, then you can, you create, importantly, the documentation around the hiring process. So that is the handbook, which is the guide for everyone in your organization. Here's your rights and responsibilities as an employee. Then from there you decide, okay, what, what role do I need to fill? What's going to move the needle for me? Do I need teachers? Do I need a front desk? And then create a job description that's not a complete blow by blow narrative of everything that the, in, in the job, but as an overview of the expectations of the job. Mm -hmm. And that serves as an outline for you then to craft a job posting. Right. And right. I have some interesting places to post that are not typical, you know, indeed does work. Things are getting better. I think right now I have a client that got five applicants for a teaching position last week. She was very excited as yeah. I um, and then from there, you craft your interview strategy. And what's important now more than has been in the past is to be consistent and make sure that you ask everyone the same questions 
and that they relate specifically to the job. So for instance, questions like, what did you do last summer? Doesn't relate to your skills as a Pilates teacher. Yeah. But if you ask, where was your training? Um, how many clients do you think you've seen over the last few years? Those sorts of things relate directly to the job. Yeah. And then it's important, I think, um, to keep a couple things in mind when you're looking at, at a job applicant. We developed a process where the applicant went through all three of us owners to interview. And that did a couple of things. It kept, we, we kept our own um, interview results to ourselves until all those interviews were done. So we didn't bias the other two people when they were interviewing. And I think that's really important because who knows, you might have a bad day and that person came in with the color you didn't like and who knows what happened, right? So then it also served to show us that the applicant was really invested in coming to work for us because they had to come to three separate interviews. Mm -hmm. All the way through, we were very clear on the expectations. So just like you do on onboarding a client, we were sending out emails ahead of time. Today, you're going to interview with Pierre. Tomorrow, you're going to interview with Katie. Um, here's where to park. Here's how to check in. Here's how long we think you're going to be here. And then the follow-up expectations from there, right? So then the next email went out and said, okay, you're going to interview with Louise. So this will be an audition. Expect to see a client for 30 minutes. We're going to be working on X, Y, and Z equipment. After that was done, the last interview was with Claudia. Here again are the expectations. So while we didn't spoon feed a lot, we allowed that applicant to be comfortable when they walked in the door. Mm -hmm. okay? you remember how terrified you were with your first interview? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that for anyone. Feels like a long time ago now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that also sets the tone for the, the applicant to relax into the to the process a little bit and maybe show you more of themselves than they might if they were a little bit more reserved or scared. Right. right. Let's say you decide, okay, I love this person. I'm going to bring them on board. Again, it's important to send an offer letter. Here's the role. Here are the salary um, requirements or salary that we agreed on. This is your starting day. This is the expected schedule for the first two or three weeks. There's nothing worse than showing up and going, okay, what am I going to do tomorrow and the next day? Yeah. Um, and give them a deadline to accept the offer, right? In the background, you've created a nice, thorough onboarding process. And this is where you can use a current um, employee or contractor to help you. You know, what did it look like to come into our studio when you first started here? So let that person inform you. What are the day-to-day -day things that you feel it's important to know right away, mm -hmm. to know in the first 30 days, to know in the first 60 or 90 days? We had um, a nice employee uh, manual. That was the day-to-day -day operations, and it had checklists in it. So as the new employee came on board, there were areas that they had to cover right away, like what's the safety stuff? Where's the fire extinguisher and the AED and things like that? And then as they went through their onboarding process, even if the training was handed off to someone else, that person that took the new person on board knew exactly where they were in their onboarding, what was checked off, who did what, right? Yeah. It just made it so seamless and we, we could... It was an area where we could coach through if something wasn't getting done or if they didn't understand it. Yeah. We could spend a little extra time. Sometimes that would make us go and look at that onboarding process again and go, oh, we missed that piece. That right. was our bad, you know? Yeah. And once you have done, you kind of mapped out this sort of three phases of the process of hiring. And once you have done this once within sort of this framework, you would go back and like you said, you would, you're going to reuse, you know, or re, you're going to, you're going to follow the same, same path yeah. the next time you do this, the same process next time you do that. And it makes hiring so much easier when you have a plan 
like right. that also, right? Right. Um, I think often it's very over, it's sort of the idea of finding the right person. Am I going to find the right person? Is there anyone out there who wants to do this? Can I, are they, you know, and, and it can be very overwhelming and, and perhaps a little off putting, but once, you know, that having it broken down, like you just said, it makes it a lot more doable. Yeah. And I, I think too, um, I believe in, you know, we have the adage, hire, slow, fire, fast. Mm -hmm. I actually like to flip that because if you have all of this in place and you see the right person, you can hire quickly. Yeah. And then as they're onboarded and in their tenure with you, because you've spent time and effort getting them there and you hired them for the right reasons, I really believe that um, coaching and career development can keep you from having to fire them quickly, right? Right. Um, if you have to fire quickly, I think that's that's on the employer. I I believe, right? You you made a mistake somewhere along the line. I mean, you know, every once in a while that's not true, but we were big proponents of turning the lens back on us if something was going wrong, and not being afraid really to to be the the manager we needed to be. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really important as far as I, I think we've all sat in the office and gone, Oh my gosh, that person is just going downhill and not doing the right thing. But yet when you look inward and you ask yourself, have I coached them? Have I talked to them? Have yes. I asked them why what's going on in their lives that maybe is causing this problem? I'll yeah, totally. 99% of the time you have not. Yeah. Right. And that's on that, us. Yeah. And that communication is, is the communication and the expert setting those expectations early on is really critical, right? So mm -hmm. that happens when you, from that moment that you establish that job post that is that, you know, and you're doing that from that very, very beginning point throughout the interview process and then into the onboarding process, you know, it, it's about setting the expectations and letting the candidate and, and then your employee know you know, what the expectations are and where they're heading. And then it doesn't stop, you know, after that first week or that first day that they started, you are as the leader in the business, you are managing them and your whole business, but you're also the leader to them. And you have, you have to be thoughtful about who you how you can continue to develop your team so that they can be as supportive to you in the business as possible. Um, and you kind of have it. Sometimes that means you have to put aside perhaps they might do things slightly differently to you. Um, mm -hmm. But you have, you know, you cannot expect to hire people that are identical to you. That doesn't ever happen. And you have different skills to what they have. And there's different ways to, um, to support your team members, depending on their skills and depending on their interests as well. And I think there's always a lot of opportunity in there when you take the time to think about what that might be. Um, is that what you also found? Yes. And, and, you know, our people had great ideas that we hadn't thought of. And if they weren't in an environment where they felt comfortable to share those with us, we would have missed out on some pretty cool things that we ended up doing in our studio. For and, sure. you know, as you say, we can't have them look just like us. Diversity is a, a huge part of that, you know, and I think making sure that you bring in people with diverse skills that work with diverse populations or are of a different culture or persuasion than you are. I mean, it opens yourself you way up to all sorts of neat things, right? A hundred percent. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, I could continue on and we have so much more we could talk about. Yes. So um, we're going to, but we're going to hit pause right here because Katie will be coming back on the podcast to talk more about all of those things and more um, management, leadership and um, human resources, uh, Resource, human resources, resources. Is that something? <laughs> people stuff. Yeah. People stuff. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So like I said, Katie is a member of the Spring 3 team and she's a big part of our Thrive um, business coaching program um, and is on our calls each and every week. So all of our Thrive members get to um, ask Katie all of their big questions about leadership and people management and studio organization. Um, and um, if you are interested in connecting with Katie, she can be found at fitnesshr.com. Um, I'm going to link to her page in the show notes below, but um, is there anything you want to let everyone know before we hop off here today, Katie? 
I just want to say, trust yourself as a leader. You know, it's like learning to lift weights or learning to do the hundred. It's practice. So the first time is a bit of a mess. The next time is not so bad. And the third time is a lot easier. So just practice those leadership skills. Trust yourself, trust your team. Oh, that's wonderful advice. Thank you so much for coming on here and sharing your incredible wisdom and expertise with all of us. I know that it's incredibly helpful and so appreciated. Thanks, Saren. It's a joy to talk to you always. Always. Thank you. So I know that this probably was incredibly helpful to you as you go and build your boutique fitness studio business. And if you're loving what you're hearing, um, I would be so appreciative if you could take a quick minute to go to wherever you're listening to this and rate and review this podcast. It really will mean a lot to me and will help me to be able to help you more and more people like you more so that more studio owners just like you can feel encouraged and supported on their journey in our industry.